So, ladies and gentlemen, let me start. Uh, welcome, and uh, we have today the 52nd talk of the scheduling seminar, and uh, Mike Pinedo will introduce the speaker. Okay, let me introduce Cheda Ogus. Most of you probably know her already. She got her PhD at Bill Kent University. And then she went and spent a long time in Hong Kong at Hong Kong Polytech uh, with a group of Edwin Chang. And uh, uh, after being 11 years in Hong Kong, she decided to go back home. And now she is a professor at uh, Koch University in uh, Istanbul. She's going to talk about math heuristic for generalized order acceptance. She already explained to me what the difference is between order acceptance and order rejects. Uh, she is going to, uh, okay, uh, Cheda, you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, I want to thank you once again to you and uh, to the uh, group for uh, having such a very, uh, very a productive uh, seminar series. I think it is very useful uh, for everybody, especially for those uh, who are doing uh, research in this area. Um, so thank you very much once more. And it's a pleasure uh, to present uh, one of my uh, studies. Uh, as you said, I will present a math heuristic for the generalized uh, order acceptance and scheduling problem. Uh, this is a joint uh, research with Istanj Tarhan. Uh, Istanj was uh, my uh, PhD student. Uh, we started working on this problem during uh, his PhD studies. Uh, he is now an assistant professor at the uh, University College Dublin. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, I will present what uh, our problem is. And I will very briefly go through the literature uh, and uh, during this definition and the literature, I will try to differentiate order acceptance and the order rejection as uh, Mike asked me uh, earlier. Uh, so it is good to know that distinction, I think. Then I will present uh, an MILP model that we developed for uh, our problem. Uh, then I will go through the details of the materialistic algorithm to solve this uh, difficult problem. Uh, after talking about the computational studies, I will conclude my uh, talk. So when we uh, look at uh, the order acceptance and scheduling problem, we see that uh, its origins actually coming from uh, what we know as the make to order systems. In such systems, uh, as name implies, uh, the production happens based on the orders given by the customers. So here the idea is uh, to um, uh, customize the products uh, required by the uh, customers. And also in other uh, cases, uh, keeping the finished products inventory uh, from the manufacturer side could be very expensive. So they, uh, rather than um, working make to stock, they work make to order. So in uh, such uh, systems, uh, we also see that the capacity is uh, quite limited compared to the customer uh, orders. So the number of customer uh, orders usually exceeds the capacity of the producer. And uh, so we say that on one side, we have the uh, capacity limitation in such systems, but also we have a time limitation. Uh, this is coming from the requirements of the customers as we are um, uh, working make to order and customizing uh, the uh, products. The customer says that uh, I need my uh, products at a certain uh, time. Uh, and usually they are uh, willing to wait uh, for their customized products for some times. And we can uh, consider it as a due date for that uh, product. Uh, but after that time, uh, they, they will start to be unhappy, right? So uh, we can say that uh, after that time, the producer will incur a tardiness cost uh, that is kind of a penalty uh, to be applied, not to be late uh, for the due date given by the customers. 
So um, when we uh, look at uh, such a problem, actually, we also say that uh, this due date can be an acceptable date for the customer. But uh, as we said, the customer can wait for some time, but there will be a hard deadline after which the customer will not accept the product. Right. So uh, we are not only working with a due date in this problem, we also have a deadline after which uh, if the producer uh, tries to uh, give the product, the customer will not accept. Hence, uh, we will say that the tardiness cost will be incurred only between uh, these two time uh, points, that is um, from due date till the deadline. So producing after the deadline has no point for the producer. So in such a, a system, uh, we see that there are actually two decisions to be uh, fulfilled and these decisions to be made simultaneously. One of them is, uh, as the um, name of the problem uh, tells us, the order acceptance. So here we are trying to decide which orders to accept. As we said, the number of orders uh, is usually much larger than the uh, capacity of the producer. So this will be one of the decisions that the producer should make. And then once um, we have these uh, accepted orders, scheduling problems uh, is the next decision and we have to decide how to schedule them. Obviously, uh, if these uh, will be done in that sequence, that is if I first decide about the orders to be accepted and then schedule them, uh, the overall problem becomes easier, but uh, then it may not be optimal. Hence, we are trying to make these two decisions simultaneously, and this uh, brings a more um, a higher difficulty into our uh, problem. But with the integration of these two decisions, we actually have uh, what is known as the order acceptance and scheduling uh, problem. Now, in our uh, problem, uh, or in this talk, uh, I will basically uh, give you a, a generalized version of this order acceptance uh, problem, and I will describe it uh, later. But generalizations, uh, generalization comes from the fact that we include, uh, on top of the due date and the deadlines, uh, the release time uh, for the orders and also uh, sequence dependent setup times, which obviously makes the, uh, make the problem more uh, difficult. Right. So um, in order to differenti differentiate this problem from uh, uh, the order acceptance and scheduling problems presented in the literature, we call them as the generalized order acceptance and scheduling problem. Now, when we uh, look at the literature, we see that uh, the order acceptance and scheduling problem uh, has been researched uh, for more than uh, three decades, actually. Uh, and there are many, many different versions. I'm not going to explain all of them, uh, but uh, we can say that uh, it goes back to 1992. And there are uh, some studies which are uh, considering only the due dates. There are no deadlines. Actually, the due date and deadline distinction came into the picture in uh, 2004 uh, with the study of uh, Chan Siri, Sapsul, and uh, other uh, studies. And then um, in 2010, uh, we have uh, this um, study in which we extended the problem by including the sequence dependent setup time and the release time. Uh, this uh, generalization actually came from a real life uh, problem. Uh, there was a, a packaging company uh, for the food products and uh, in their production, uh, they are working uh, on uh, orders and they have a very limited capacity. But when we uh, looked at the problem, uh, we see that uh, the sequence dependent setup time is very important because they are printing uh, what the product is on the package. And this is dependent on the sequence that they um, uh, produce. Hence, uh, at that time, we uh, studied this problem. And today I will present the same problem, actually, but a different uh, solution uh, methodology. At that time, we came up with an uh, MILP model formulation and uh, some heuristic algorithms. Um, following that study, there were uh, many other um, studies in this line. And they are uh, mostly focusing on the 
meta heuristic algorithms, as you can uh, see from uh, this list, I will not go through them one by one. Uh, the latest uh, that we see is in 2021, uh, some heuristic algorithms based on dynamic programming. Actually, this uh, study also has some uh, exact solutions, which I will uh, talk about at the end of my talk when I'm comparing the results. Uh, apart from these uh, meta heuristic based uh, studies, of course, there are uh, studies uh, focusing on the exact algorithms, as you can uh, see here. But uh, most of these uh, studies uh, study the simple order acceptance and scheduling uh, problems. Now, uh, when we look at the literature, actually, uh, apart from the single machine uh, order acceptance and scheduling problems, there are uh, studies looking at the uh, multiple machines, like parallel machines or uh, flow shop environments, and also uh, there is uh, another uh, line which is focusing on the order rejection. Uh, I didn't prepare a slide for that one, but uh, the, that line is a bit different because uh, rather than uh, developing uh, such meta heuristics, uh, etc., they focus on the um, uh, theoretical side of the problem. Actually, we can consider these as the mirror images. In our problem, we are looking at which uh, orders to be accepted. And in the other, uh, we are looking at which orders to be rejected. But in that uh, setting, of course, uh, the problems are more, uh, sim uh, they are simpler. Uh, for example, as far as I know, there are no uh, studies um, considering uh, sequence dependent setup times, uh, because as I mentioned, they are uh, looking at those problem more analytically. They are developing uh, fully polynomial uh, approximation schemes, uh, that sort of uh, line, uh, research line, we can see in the order rejection uh, problems. Um, so when we look at our uh, generalized order acceptance and scheduling problem, what we wanted to do is to find an efficient and effective uh, solution method. Um, and given the MP hard status of the problem, uh, we developed, a meta, um, a, first of all, a mathematical uh, model, and then uh, seeing that we cannot uh, solve um, even the medium size instances with the model, uh, we proposed a math heuristic uh, algorithm, which makes uh, use of the strengths of the mathematical model together with the uh, meta heuristics. So uh, I will uh, start um, uh, giving you the uh, model that we uh, develop, mathematical model. Um, and uh, here, uh, before giving the model, let me introduce the uh, definitions related to the parameters and then the decision variables. With that, I will formally introduce the problem as well. So we have... Uh, a number of orders uh, coming from the customers. Uh, we will use uh, capital O to denote that set of orders. Uh, we also uh, included two uh, dummy uh, orders in order to facilitate um, the sequence dependent setup times in our uh, model. Uh, SIJ uh, will denote the setup time between order I and order J. Uh, this will be dependent on the uh, sequence, so uh, it is an important decision in which order we uh, process these orders. Uh, PI, uh, as in general, uh, denotes the processing time of order. We have a revenue uh, denoted by EI that we gain uh, by accepting and uh, preparing it for the uh, customer. And each order will be identified with its release time its due date and deadline. And as I explained earlier, if uh, the producer uh, produces the order in between the due date and deadline, there will be a tardiness uh, to be incurred. And uh, we will have a VI uh, as the unit tardiness cost of that order. Now, in our uh, model, um, we uh, actually, our uh, model uh, is a, a precedence-based mathematical model, and uh, we 
we were motivated for this model uh, by the travel assessment uh, problem formulation of uh, Gavish and Graves uh, that that was uh, done in 1978. Uh, and uh, here uh, we chose this type of uh, representation because release times and uh, deadlines could be handled more uh, effectively in this um, uh, in this structure. So here our decision variables will be first of all li to denote whether we accept an order or not. Uh, then we will have another uh, binary decision uh, variable yij. Uh, to denote the uh, presence relations between two orders. Uh, so yij will be one if order j is processed immediately after uh, order i, zero otherwise. Um, then we will have uh, gij denoting the completion time of order j if, uh, of course, order i immediately precedes uh, order j and zero otherwise. Um, yeah. And tardiness uh, of the um, uh, order J uh, will be denoted by Tij, again, uh, based on the uh, president's uh, relations uh, between uh, I and J. So if you look at the model, uh, it, oops, sorry. Uh, it is quite simple. Uh, in our objective function, we want to maximize our net revenue. So this is the uh, revenue that we obtain from uh, accepted orders. And this is the tardiness we created if we um, produce any of the orders after their due, due date, but before the deadline. So here we are maximizing our net profit. Uh, and then uh, the constraints, uh, if you look at the second and the third uh, set of constraints here, we are saying that each accepted order is preceded and succeeded by only one order, respectively. So this is uh, telling us that uh, sequence. And the uh, fourth uh, constraint uh, is there to eliminate the subtours uh, sub that we uh, create. So we want to have one sequence uh, going consecutively, similar to travel assessment problem. Then uh, the constraints, uh, constraints sets five and six uh, actually uh, guarantee that we are uh, processing each order between its release time and its deadline. Uh, here we see these uh, GIJ uh, lower bound and upper bound uh, rather than the release time and the uh, deadline because uh, here we are having a pre-processing on those and uh, we obtain these values based on the uh, sequence that we obtain for the um, orders. Hence, we have this sequence-based uh, mathematical model. And finally, uh, in uh, constraint set seven, we define our tardiness. And uh, in the last one, we define the domain of our decision variables. So um, when we uh, look at this problem, uh, we see that the problem is MP hard. And when we try to solve this mathematical programming uh, model uh, with the commercial sol solvers, uh, we see that as the number of orders uh, increases, we cannot uh, solve them as easily as uh, the instances of a small number of orders. So uh, because of that reason, we um, decided to develop a maturistic algorithm. And here our motivation was uh, the fact that the mathematical model worked quite well for small instances. So we thought that if we can decompose our original problem into sub problems, such that in every sub problem, we have a manageable number of orders and solve it with the MINP model that we develop, uh, then we can have a better solution uh, compared to a solution method that is using pure uh, metaheuristic algorithms. So uh, what we do here then, uh, actually, we first um, uh, decompose our problem uh, with the time dimension. And then uh, based on that decomposition, we have a math heuristic that will use two different MILP models. 
And we say that this maturistic uh, is an iterative two-phase uh, maturistic algorithm. Uh, we have an assign and schedule uh, modules. <clears throat> this is very uh, straightforward since the problem is uh, order acceptance and scheduling. As I explained earlier, we have to make these decisions. First, we have to decide uh, which orders to be accepted and then we have to schedule. But if we uh, make them in that order, we may not obtain the optimal solution. So these decisions should be made uh, simultaneously. But we want to use uh, these um, um, natural decomposition in the problem. And in the first phase, we focus on the assignment of the orders. And in the second phase, we focus on the scheduling part of the problem. However, uh, in the maturistic, we um, <clears throat> use these modules iteratively until we hit the uh, stopping condition for this uh, problem. So here, um, once uh, we uh, decompose the problem into those uh, sub-problems on the time dimension, we are basically assigning our orders in the first phase to particular time segments of the planning horizon. And when we are doing that, we exclude the sequence dependent setup times from consideration uh, explicitly. But implicitly, the sequence dependent setup times will be there, as I will explain um, later. Then uh, we will solve this uh, problem, the overall problem, under the restrictions provided by assign, uh, assignment part uh, in the second phase. And this will create a schedule. And uh, then the output of the schedule will be fed again to the assignment uh, stage. And this will go like this until uh, we hit the stopping uh, condition. So actually, this is the uh, general uh, scheme of our uh, solution uh, procedure. Uh, as I mentioned, we first start uh, by the uh, assign module. This will give uh, certain assignments made at certain times, uh, time slots, and this will be fed into the schedule phase. Once we obtain a new solution here, we will um, improve it with a local search, which is based on a taboo search. And until the time limit uh, is hit, we feed the output of this local search to the assign phase, and we will repeat this uh, procedure. Hence, we have an iterative two-phase uh, math heuristic. So if you look at the uh, first phase, that uh, that is the assignment, as I mentioned before we start here, we decompose the planning uh, horizon into smaller time segments. And here, uh, I will show it in the uh, coming slides, we will be using a relaxed time bucket formulation to assign the orders to the time segments. But here, of course, the important thing is to find out those uh, time points. Um, our motivation here actually comes from the fact that uh, the time-based um, modeling, the mathematical model that will be based on the uh, time-based formulation, actually gives very good um, assignment decisions. However, of course, um, due to large number of time uh, points, uh, it becomes very uh, inefficient. So we said that rather than considering a, a time index uh, formulation, let's have some time buckets. And here, uh, as you can see uh, in this figure, the planning horizon T was divided into those uh, time buckets. And we denote those intervals between two adjacent uh, indices. Uh, by index k so that uh, we have um, this many um, time buckets. Here, uh, I want to mention two important things. Uh, first of all, the length of the uh, time buckets was determined based on the longest processing time that we have in the instances, uh, because um, <clears throat> In the literature, this time type of uh, time bucket uh, formulations were done based on the smallest processing time. But uh, when we apply that, we see that uh, that uh, approach is still very inefficient. We cannot obtain good solutions in a reasonable time. 
So then uh, we tried the largest processing time and it gave uh, quite good solution uh, quality in a uh, much uh, faster time. So we chose uh, to go like that. And uh, when we have this structure, we have this um, characteristic that if an order starts its processing in one of the time buckets, it will complete its processing either in this uh, bucket or it will complete in the next time bucket uh, in the worst case. So um, this means that, for example, an order uh, cannot have such a situation. It starts in this uh, ELT time bucket and it finishes in uh, L plus two or later. We cannot have such situations, right? So we make use of uh, this structure in our algorithm. So that uh, characteristic is uh, important for us. Um, then uh, once we have these time buckets, we uh, divide our original time, uh, original planning horizon T uh, into several segments. And we denote this uh, set of segments uh, by S. Uh, here, the important thing is that the length of each segment will be different than uh, others. So this is not an equally divided uh, segment. And the uh, end point and starting point of each segment will coincide with one of the uh, time points that we um, decided in this division for the time buckets, right? So each segment will include a couple of uh, time buckets from the previous uh, setup. Here, the idea, um, as I mentioned, we use this one because we know that time index formulation gives a good assignment, so we want to use that. But still, uh, so many time uh, points will make the algorithm inefficient. So we rather have a much smaller number of um, time points, hence we created these segments. And here the idea is that we find those segments such that the number of orders assigned to each segment can be solved with the MILP model uh, quite uh, efficiently. Right? So uh, we know that uh, with our computation studies, small instances can be solved um, with MILP model to the optimality. So we want to use uh, that aspect. Let me check my time. Okay, maybe I, I have to be a bit uh, quicker. So um, in this uh, part, what, uh, we will use a modified uh, mathematical model and for that one, uh, we will use these decision variables. Uh, first of all, we will denote the, um, uh, whether an order uh, has started uh, and completed in an interval or uh, an order has started in an interval and it is completed in the next interval. We make that distinction. And then uh, we also have to look at the completion time of uh, order I lies in one time segment. Um, or not, because I uh, we want to know uh, what is the amount of the processing order which is left to the next time um, uh, segment if uik prime is one. Um, and uh, we will use qik to denote that amount. And again, uh, tardiness of the order will be measured and we denote it by ti in this um, uh, model. Remember, we are not using uh, sequence dependent setup times explicitly. Hence, uh, we, we are not using TIJ as in our original model. Um, so here, <clears throat> uh, if you look at the uh, model, uh, the objective function is still the same. We are trying to maximize the net revenue. And here in this um, uh, constraint, we are trying to uh, tell that uh, the sum of the processing times assigned uh, to a segment uh, will not be greater than uh, that interval uh, because we want uh, to be in that uh, interval. Uh, and then uh, the next one um, says that there cannot be more than one order being processed at the beginning of uh, any time interval. Uh, this is due to the characteristic that I mentioned earlier. And the amount of 
<clears throat> that order to be uh, processed in the interval uh, cannot be greater than its processing time. Uh, in the next constraint set, uh, constraint set 13, we are linking our decision variables, uh, UIK and uh, AIS. <clears throat> and uh, we are basically saying that um, each time segment uh, will be uh, through those uh, time uh, buckets because uh, we said that every time segment should uh, consist of several time uh, buckets. So this constraint satisfies that. And then uh, here we again define our uh, tardiness. And uh, I uh, skipped this one. The 14th uh, constraint set defines that an order is assigned to only one segment, obviously. And uh, here we define the uh, tardiness. And then uh, we will have a cut set. Uh, this cut set will be identified by the second phase. Once we solve the schedule uh, part, we will obtain this cut set and it will be fed into this uh, model. Obviously, when we are running this at the first iteration, there will be no cut sets. But after the uh, first iteration, there will be cut sets coming from the other phase. And then we define the domain of our decision variables. So the assign uh, part is very uh, simple, as you can see. We um, <clears throat> solve that mathematical model. And uh, as I mentioned, if it is uh, after the first iteration, we will have certain uh, cuts uh, incorporated. Now, when we look at the second phase, uh, now we have the uh, assignments for every time segment. And then uh, we will schedule these assigned orders for each segment separately. That is, we will run our MILP model uh, for each segment, and we will do this sequentially. So here I want to use this OS uh, to denote the set of orders assigned to time segment S. So uh, we will run our MILP uh, for these orders only. And since we are um, solving the problem um, as subproblems, limited by the endpoints of these segments, we are uh, updating the release time and the deadline of uh, the orders uh, by considering the start and the end time of those segments. So we have these modified release times and the deadlines uh, that is fed into the MILP model. And uh, the second phase uh, considers uh, actually each segment, as I mentioned, one by one. Once we uh, obtain a schedule for uh, a segment, it will be uh, concatenated to the previous ones, as we mentioned here. And uh, we will denote the partial schedules with X, S, uh, and the output of the MILP will be denoted by Pi S. So here Pi S is the schedule for just one single segment whereas XS is the partial schedule that we will obtain by concatenating all these uh, single segment uh, schedules. Now here, one important thing is, of course, when we have the first phase and we assign uh, orders to those uh, different segments, certain orders uh, will not be assigned. So these will not be accepted. So we will assign them to a dummy segment and at the scheduling step, we say that um, let's consider those rejected orders and run a metaheuristic, which is based on a variable neighborhood search for the partial solution X uh, that we obtained so far. Um, once we have this updated schedule, partial schedule, this will include, this may include uh, those rejected orders uh, coming from the first phase. And this will help us to reach the uh, optimal solution as closely as possible. Right? So this is an important part for the scheduling uh, aspect. And uh, once we obtain our uh, final schedule uh, from the uh, 
second uh, phase, uh, we see that sometimes that uh, result is not uh, very close to the optimal solution. And uh, we want to uh, improve this local uh, optimum. And for that one, uh, we used a taboo search algorithm. And uh, here, uh, as a local search algorithm within that, we again uh, utilize the variable neighborhood descent uh, algorithm. And um, I will not go into the details, but here the most important thing is that um, this is a multi-start uh, taboo search algorithm. And uh, the uh, initial solutions for the new start were created by using a petri linking algorithm. And uh, we again uh, use a different version of the petri linking. Basically, we try to exclude the solutions which are very close to the uh, starting uh, solution and the uh, guiding solution that comes from the elite set of uh, our solutions. Because what we uh, see that these solutions will be very similar to either to the elite solution or the uh, starting solution. And there is not much point to uh, start from them. So after excluding them, we uh, look at the remaining solutions generated by this petri linking and the uh, solution with the best objective function is selected as our uh, new starting um, position. We call this as the multi-start granulating taboo search because in the variable neighborhood um, uh, descent algorithm, we restrict the size of the neighborhoods, again, uh, to make our math heuristic more uh, efficient. So uh, here uh, I want to mention uh, that interaction between the assign and the schedule uh, phases. Once assign uh, gives the assignment of orders uh, to time segments, uh, we said that the schedule creates uh, the scheduling part. And uh, sometimes we see that uh, the same orders are kept uh, being assigned uh, to the same segment over and over again. Of course, this is uh, not efficient. It causes cycling. In order to eliminate that, we created those cuts uh, from the schedule phase and feed that into the assign uh, phase so that uh, at the assign phase, at the next iteration or the following iterations, different assignments can be made uh, to different segments so that we can improve our solution. Another um, communication between these two phases will be due to the processing time. Remember, we said that we are not uh, using the uh, sequence dependent setup times uh, explicitly in the assignment uh, part. Uh, rather than doing that, we uh, use a <clears throat> updated processing time that includes uh, a guess of the setup time to be used. And this will be fed, of course, after the schedule part uh, is complete. And um, with the schedule that we have from the second phase, we will know uh, which orders come before uh, which order. And from that, we will uh, make an estimation on the setup time. And this will be um, added to the original processing time so that uh, the assignment will be made by using such processing times. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the uh, computational uh, results. Uh, we compared our uh, math heuristic algorithm with our proposed mathematical model just to see how it is performing for the uh, small sized uh, instances. And then uh, we compare uh, our Maturistic algorithm with the state of the art algorithms, that is SSP algorithm uh, proposed by Silva et al. and uh, Spiro algorithm uh, proposed by He et al. and um, um, FPTS uh, and Balas um, algorithms proposed by uh, Devert uh, and others in 2021. So uh, the instances that we used uh, are coming from the previous study because all of the previous studies use the same instances. So we want to be consistent. And the optimality gap is um, computed in a classical manner. So if you look at the comparison of um, uh, our mathematical model with the SSP from the literature, 
we see that uh, our model uh, can solve um, uh, up and including 25 orders, whereas in the literature, uh, starting from uh, 15 orders, uh, some of the instances cannot be solved to optimality. Uh, so here we see the number of um, uh, instances for which the optimal solution has been uh, found. Uh, even though the, there are only a few uh, which are not optimal, uh, with our MILP model, we can obtain the optimal solution for all of the instances, uh, up and including 25 um, uh, orders. And uh, the uh, CPU time is uh, much better in our case. Um, if we look at the uh, comparison of our uh, materialistic algorithm with the MILP, uh, just to uh, see uh, how we are doing for uh, large instances, n is equal to 50, and in the next slide I will show uh, for 100 uh, orders, we can see that uh, the gaps uh, that we obtain from the MILP uh, is not uh, very high here, uh, but uh, the maturistic obtains a much better um, gap. And if you look at the number of optimal solutions that we obtain, it is uh, much higher compared to the MILP model. And um, I didn't mention, I think, earlier, uh, for our maturistic, we uh, gave 900 seconds uh, as the time limit. So for uh, 100 uh, orders, we see that uh, our gap is uh, quite uh, reasonable and the number of uh, optimal solutions is also uh, very high compared to the MILP. Uh, this is an expected result. MILP cannot obtain uh, good solutions for large uh, instances. Um, so here in the slide, you see the uh, number of uh, optimal solutions obtained uh, by our maturistic algorithm because one of the aim of our study was to uh, push the boundary of the uh, optimal solutions uh, obtained. So um, for n is equal to 25, uh, 50, and 100, we uh, listed those results. The first column uh, gives the number of optimal solutions found in the literature, and the second one uh, shows our uh, numbers. As we can see, uh, as the number of orders increase, uh, of course, difficulty also increases in the problem. But in uh, each of the cases, we obtain much better results in terms of the number of optimal solutions found. Um, in this uh, slide, uh, I want to show the um, uh, comparison of our uh, results our maturistic algorithm uh, with the latest uh, studies. So here we see two uh, FPTA's uh, heuristic algorithms, which was um, differentiated by the uh, value of epsilon. And also here we have uh, two other uh, heuristic algorithms. They differ from the um, uh, parameter which is used to define the neighborhood, uh, which has been used in these uh, uh, heuristic algorithms. We can easily see that uh, this matur maturistic algorithm that we uh, proposed gives much better uh, results in terms of the gap. And also, if we look at the uh, CPU time, since we have a fixed time limit, of course, uh, for the small, uh, or let's say for n is equal to 50, uh, it is not very uh, easy to compare the results. But uh, here we did uh, an extra uh, comparison, and we see that if we uh, stop the maturistic much earlier, actually uh, we can obtain uh, quite um, comparable results uh, with the CPU time of this uh, study. And uh, for uh, n is equal to 100, uh, the situation is similar. Um, here uh, we see the results of our uh, maturistic algorithm uh, compared to SSP and Sparrow. Uh, and here, if you look at the average values, we see that when n is equal to 50, uh, we have much better uh, results. Uh, even though we can say that uh, Sparrow is doing better than SSP and it is comparable to our results. But um, 
here the thing is that for Sparrow, we don't have the CPU time. It was not um, given. They just state that it is under one minute on average. And uh, hence here we compare our CPU time with the SSP. And for 100 uh, orders, uh, again, uh, we can see that our results are, um, are much better compared to uh, both of these uh, state-of-the-art uh, algorithms. Uh, so um, we can say that uh, in this uh, study, uh, the proposed maturistic algorithm uh, actually worked quite well. It has the strengths of the uh, new MILP model that we uh, proposed, which was based on the uh, sequence-based uh, decision variables. And also uh, by making use of the benefits of the uh, time uh, index formulation, uh, we obtained a relaxed time bucket formulation uh, to be used in the maturistic algorithm. And then uh, we also uh, utilize the strengths of the maturistic algorithms like uh, variable neighborhood search algorithm, uh, which is known to be working very well for the uh, general uh, tardiness scheduling uh, problems. And also taboo search algorithm, which is known to, uh, to be very good for fine tuning uh, of the uh, solutions. So we used a multi-start granular uh, taboo search uh, to fine tune our uh, solutions obtained. Um, what to, to do next? Uh, we can say that uh, some new relaxed models, including setup times for the first phase of our maturistic can be uh, developed and this can uh, strengthen the results of the maturistic. And also, as a branch and bound algorithm through the assignment variables uh, can be utilized and uh, integrated into a maturistic um, algorithm. So I think um, I used up my time, uh, so I will stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, uh, I will be happy to hear them. Okay, Yena, thank you very much. And uh, now let me open the questions. Uh, so if anybody wants to ask something or share some view, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, don't hesitate and go ahead. Uh, and maybe if nobody does so at the beginning, um, did you consider also to have something like uh, equidistant uh, time buckets uh, uh, related, for example, to weeks or to some natural uh, natural periods uh, that are in production, right? Uh, yeah, actually, because then obviously maybe deadlines are also related to weeks because some companies are working in calendar weeks and uh, and, and so right. That's true. Um, to be honest, um, our instances generated randomly, so I'm not quite sure whether there is such a pattern. Uh, probably mm -hmm. there is not. Uh, so from the instance uh, point of view, we don't have that, but uh, we um, uh, tried our approach with equal um, values uh, for the time buckets, and we see that it didn't give uh, a better solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so this uh, different size time buckets uh, work much better. So we prefer to go ahead with that one. Mm -hmm. And if the deadlines are related to time buckets uh, as well, uh, do you think it might make the problem easier? Or, of course, there is still a traveling salesman problem in it, right? Yeah. But, uh, but uh, maybe. Uh... Yeah, uh, could be uh, because um, actually the uh kind of difficulty of the problem is related to the time windows uh the time windows which are defined by the release times and the uh deadlines or due dates yeah. whatever you consider so uh if uh we can um relate uh, time buckets and if they are large in that sense then uh, we can um accept more orders uh in an easier way so this will make the problem uh much easier so your uh, instinct is correct in that sense. Thank you. Maybe Alessandro, maybe you have a question. You are muted. Uh, yes. So I want to say hello to Jada. Hi, Alessandro. <laughs> it was a very nice uh, seminar. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Uh, I also have a question concerning time buckets. So if I understood correctly, you... Um, 
when you define uh, the time indices, so these time intervals, you said that they are defined in such a way that each job uh, can start in a uh, in a in an interval uh, and must end within the next interval, right? So it can only uh, yeah, it can only span exactly option one, option two. So my question is, what happens? So does this hold for any job, which means this this restriction must apply even to the longest job? Because in this case, my question would be, what happens when you have jobs which are very, very different in terms of length? Because I would expect that if you have maybe one very long job and then many small jobs, you are forced to, to make wide uh, time uh, um, uh, time intervals and... Uh, and therefore, the performance of the of the approach of the algorithm might be affected by this, or not. Um, that's true. Uh, we, to be honest, uh, we uh, chose to use this longest processing time uh, to create the um, uh, time bucket length, uh, because uh, with the other option like the shortest processing time. Uh, we end up with again too many time points uh, so the uh, assigned phase became uh, quite inefficient so our idea here is uh, to utilize the benefits of a time index uh, formula uh, uh, formulation uh, of the mathematical model so that we can have a good assignment of the orders but at the same time we want to restrict the number of um, uh, time indices uh, so that this will be uh, an efficient uh, algorithm because this is an iterative one. You know, if we run this only once, that would that wouldn't be that bad. But iteratively, we are running this phase many many times. So um, because of that reason, we wanted to make the number of uh, time indexes uh, small, and the best we can find was the longest processing time. Okay. But such extreme cases, yeah, uh, these can be analyzed and uh, maybe uh, we can uh, obtain some new insights from such uh, extreme cases where we have a, a very long uh, order, uh, a very long uh, processing time for an order and then many, many uh, orders with small uh, processing times. Mm. Thank you for that Thank you. Uh, question. Okay, maybe other question by my line? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we can. Uh, first of all, thank you for your great presentation, Professor. And uh, um, my question is about before using the math heuristic, have you considered the, the composition techniques that uh, your we, we obtained the exact method like the, like Bender's decomposition, cut and solve, and uh, other, other 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 exact solution? Um, we tried uh, some decomposition uh, approaches, but uh, we see that uh, they uh, didn't perform very well. And while we are working on those decomposition ideas, actually, uh, we uh, said that because, uh, as I mentioned, this was uh, the PhD, this was uh, coming from the PhD study of my uh, student, and he tried many, many different approaches. We started with the decomposition um, uh, algorithms, we look at meta heuristic algorithms, etc., different mathematical uh, model formulations. And we see that each one of them has some strengths, but none of them is working very well uh, alone. Uh, so we try to combine uh, the strengths of uh, each one of them. So we use this de decomposition um, idea, not uh, for the exact uh, algorithm development, but uh, to decompose uh, through the uh, time indexes, as I explained. And then uh, we utilize the strengths of the uh, MILP model, which is sequence-based version. Um, to obtain uh, the assignment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other question? If not, let me ask one more curious question. Uh, uh, it's, again, related a little bit to practical case. Uh, so, so imagine that you don't have that many orders, uh, uh, that are profitable, right? Maybe some of the orders are 
uh, not so profitable, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you may uh, uh, be interested to include also, let's say, for example, personal cost or resource related cost uh, to the objective function, uh, because if you don't work on the all time axis then in the free time you don't need to have a machine learning or personal working or whatever right mm -hmm. so uh, so so typically we don't do it in 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 scheduling typically we, we don't yeah. care. We, we assume that people are there machine is yeah. there and so on right but but in fact if we speak here about how profitable is the the contract uh, uh, then then it might be also the case that for 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 criterion function, you should also deduce the real cost of your resource, uh, and then the result would be different, right? Because uh, because maybe it's better to reject some of the uh, orders uh, uh, that don't bring enough of profit. Uh, so here, uh, what is your take uh, for being not profitable enough? Because, um, because in my the... resources are maybe more expensive than hmm. what the what the order will bring me right i see so of course in combinatorial we... in combinatorial meaning not for yeah. one resource and one order right but... yeah yeah so here of course yeah i understand what you are saying uh, but here uh, since we assume that um each order will bring some revenue and since i have uh, more orders than my capacity uh, actually uh, let me speak uh, from the real company that we uh, that I started working with this problem in 2010. They had too many uh, orders uh, and they didn't have enough capacity. So they just wanted to know uh, what uh, should be the decision, you know, to accept and then uh, in which order to produce that. Um, I didn't look at uh, the problem from that perspective, but yeah, that can uh, lead, uh, lead us to different uh, problems, uh, considering uh, different aspects uh, in terms of the resources being used and uh, defining the profit in a different way uh, so that, uh, yeah, that problem can be studied. Right now, I cannot yeah, say... Just a note. Yeah, yeah. yeah how, how can... Uh, well, for example, in the case of inflation, Mm, yeah, <laughs> which is the exactly. case uh, <laughs> in Europe and in Turkey, especially. Then yeah. maybe the, the the prices are sort of upside down, right? You are right. Yeah, this this can bring in uh, a different type of uh, order acceptance and scheduling problem. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice exactly. coincidence of inflation. The only That's thing, right. but nice uh, new scheduling yeah. problem. Yeah, right. thank you for that comment as well. Thank you. Okay, so anybody has a question? A note. If not, then thank you very much for being with us. Uh, and I uh, let me let me mention. Can I stop the share? So that yeah, you can leave it. Let me mention what will be the next talk. Uh, uh, the next talk in two weeks uh, will be uh, given by Niels Boysen from University of Vienna, and he will speak about scheduling in the e-commerce era, new scheduling problems in order fulfillment and warehousing. So, hello, Guo <laughs> Hello. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, and hope to meet you in two weeks. Okay? Bye-bye. Bye-bye.